guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the most interesting folks that I just want to talk about and you hopefully like to listen to on the program. Today, we got Paul Shapiro. Paul, thanks for coming. Hey, Matt. How are you doing? I am doing pretty good. And I just went through a rushed lunch and you were talking earlier. We were talking earlier about fake calamari. So let's just jump straight into it. KFC <laughs> is going crazy and frying stuff. What's the deal? Yeah, well, uh, they're definitely using something much better than what is typically used in the calamari. Uh, as a uh, fake calamari, so to speak, what KFC is doing, at least in a test at a test location in Atlanta this week, is launching plant-based chicken. So rather than raising and slaughtering chickens to make the nuggets, they are using Beyond Meat chicken. And uh, from what I saw online today, it was like a 90-minute wait to get it. So people must really like it. That's awesome because if you're going to fry it, it's not like you can taste it. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you're right about that, actually. But in all honesty, their product does taste very good on its end, too. And you've been working with f making food taste better on its own. What got you into you're, – you're very, very involved in the clean meat movement. I see you're a VP of the Humane Society. What is your story? What's the genesis of what got you into this movement? Sure. Yeah, uh, I was proud to serve as a VP at the Humane Society for over a decade. I now run my own – um, plant-based protein company called the Better Meat Co., which is uh, pioneering new methods of making plants that taste like meat at very low costs. But to answer your question directly, Matt, I have always had a concern about animals, and I've been very concerned about our treatment of them, but I'm especially also concerned about the fact that our population continues to rise and the amount of meat that people eat continues to rise. It takes a lot of resources to produce meat. And while the planet is not getting any bigger, humanity's footprint on the planet is getting bigger. And one of the biggest ways that we contribute to that footprint is through our food print, primarily how much meat we eat. Because it just takes a lot of land, water, and other resources to produce meat compared to making food from plants. So the reality for me has been these uh, systems that we use to raise and slaughter billions of animals for food are certainly bad for those animals. But they're also bad for us. They're bad for humanity. They're bad for wildlife. They're bad for the climate. And we can do better. We can innovate our way out of the factory farming of animals by coming up with better ways to feed ourselves. In the same way that we used to be reliant on horses to transport us and our goods all, all around the world, now uh, we have much better means and we don't have to rely on horses. Well, I believe that through food technology, we're going to be able to come up with better ways to far more efficiently produce the meat that people want to eat without having to raise and slaughter so many animals. Why did you go for the plant-based meat approach versus lab-grown or something similar? Yeah, great question, Matt. Uh, I am a firm believer in what's called clean meat or this uh, real meat that's grown from animal cells. In fact, I wrote the book on clean meat because I wrote the only book on clean meat, which is a, you know easy claim to make. Uh, but that book, which is called Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner in the World, came out last year. And it basically chronicles the entrepreneurs and the investors and their race to commercialize the world's first ever slaughter-free meat products. Now, as exciting as that field is, and there are now dozens of startups around the world that are attracting tens of millions of dollars of investment into their coffers to do this, it still was a pretty far ways off. They may, I mean, they're producing meat. I've eaten it many times myself. Uh, but the idea of actually selling it at any high scale where it could be like in a KFC or in a Costco or, or something like that is still many years away. And the problem is that we don't have that long to wait before we start getting a handle on this problem. Yes, we should be investing in clean meat technologies. Uh, at the same time, you know, it's just think about it like um, think about it actually like fossil fuels. You know, fossil fuels are such a serious problem that you want wind, you want solar, you want geothermal, you want lots of alternatives to fossil fuels. Factory farming of animals is also so problematic that you want lots of alternatives. Yes, you want clean meat. You also want plant-based meat. You want efforts just to reduce meat consumption or maybe like a meatless Mondays. You want other efforts to uh, make the current systems of raising animals to be actually better for the animals. So there's all types of ways that we can get at this. But I figured uh, in my own case that I really wanted to pursue something that could make a difference in the marketplace today rather than in the years to come. Basically, if we have the automobile mm. that runs on gas, if we got rid of the gas immediately before we were ready, we're kind of stuck with cars that can't drive. 
<laughs> well, yeah, it's a, it's a really good analogy, actually, Matt. So imagine, you know, right now electric cars are less than 1% of the total auto market. Well, we can make hybrid cars. We could make cars that just are far more fuel efficient also. And nobody wants to stop electric cars from advancing. But supplemental to that strategy, you also want to improve the fleets, uh, the efficiency of the fleets of the big producers as well today. Does that potentially slow down the development or the funding that goes in? So, for instance, Impossible Burger, Beyond Meat, these guys have yeah. attracted a lot of funding. Yeah, uh, they have attracted a lot of funding. But honestly, I don't think that it's reduced uh, interest. I think it's more like progress begets progress. So these rising uh, waters are lifting all boats right now in this space. And the success of Impossible and Beyond uh, is really helping fuel investor interest in smaller plant-based startups and clean meat startups too. What's your vision of the future? Well, I think that in the future, we are going to look back on the ways that we raised animals for food and we're gonna wonder how could we have ever allowed that to occur? How could we have subjected billions and billions of animals to conditions that most of us don't even want to look at, let alone would we participate in inflicting those types of conditions on those animals? And it's easy for us to look back on our ancestors and wonder how could they have ever believed certain things or engaged in certain practices that today we nearly universally believe to be wrong. However, it's much harder for us to look at our own practices and think about, well, what will future generations think of what we are doing? And when it comes to the way that we produce meat today, the inefficiency, the climate contributions, the animal welfare concerns, the public health hazards that we're causing, I don't think that our descendants are going to be that impressed with how we were doing it. And I think that they're going to be really glad that technology freed them from doing the same things that we have been doing for too long to animals on the planet in order to be able to feed ourselves. Yeah, 20% of emissions come from agriculture and animal agriculture, roughly the same as transportation. It's it's a bit nuts, really. When do we go no meat? How far out is that where we have the last real burger? Yeah, well, I would say these are still real burgers. And let me give you a quick, uh, a quick story about that, Matt. So if you go back like 150 years ago, the only way to get ice was from nature. And you had a massive ice industry that shipped ice all around the world to warmer climates where they didn't have ice. Uh, you know, you enter the advent, though, of industrial refrigeration, and all of a sudden, you have a much more efficient way to produce ice simply by cooling the water down right in front of you using this new man-made technology. Well, the ice barons of the time were livid over this innovation, and they railed against what they called artificial ice. And they said that it was unnatural, is potentially dangerous. You didn't want to put it in your kids' drinks. And you fast forward to today, and virtually all of us have artificial ice makers in our homes. We call them freezers. We don't think there's anything artificial about it at all. In fact, we probably wouldn't even consider uh, buying a home without one or renting a home without one, even though uh, the idea of human-made ice is extremely novel on the timeline of humanity's history. Well, similarly, I think that we could come to a point where we are going to have foods that look and act just like the meat that we eat today, except they're gonna be healthier, more environmentally friendly, and better for animals too. So I, I would question this idea of whether one is real or not, because I think our descendants may think that not only are these products very real, but they're preferable to the way it used to be done. But to answer your question directly, yeah, I think that right now, if you look at the market, look at uh, milk as an example. In the United States, 13% of all the fluid milk sold is now coming from plant-based sources soy, almond, coconut, and so on. Uh, about a decade ago, that was about 1%. And that's where uh, plant-based meat is today. It's still actually less than 1% of all meat that is sold is coming from plant-based meats. For the well, dairy, maybe... do, you know, do you know how much of that is due to intolerances, though, and lactose intolerance? Well, that would be yeah, interesting. Yeah, so I do think part of it is that, for sure. But I think another big part of it is that people, when, uh, when plant-based milk started getting marketed, the same way milk is marketed, then it really changed the game. So the three driving factors that really drive most food choices are taste, price, and convenience. Plant-based milks in the past uh, were not as tasty, they cost more, and they weren't convenient to buy. They, uh, you know, That changed, though, about a decade or a little bit more ago when they started getting marketed by dairy companies themselves 
who moved them out of the natural food section and directly into the dairy section, put them in cartons that looked like conventional milk. They uh, charged the same or even less for the plant-based milks, and they improved the taste. All of those factors conspired, I think, to help boost the plant-based dairy industry. Yes, you do have some lactose intolerance, but there's the same amount of lactose intolerance today as there was a decade ago, I presume. And so I'm not sure how much that had to do with it. All at the same time, uh, it's going to take some time. You know, when 99% of meat that we eat today comes from animals, in fact, more than 99%, even if you have like a quintupling of demand for plant-based meat, you're still going to have virtually all meat coming from animals. And uh, that's one reason why I think it's so important to focus not just on uh, going fully plant-based with these products, but also blending. It's imperative that we start blending plant-based proteins directly into meat that people were eating to help them make hybrid type products so that for people who, let's say, don't want to go whole hog or really like no hog and go uh, to eating a uh, vegan meat product, maybe they're happy to eat a burger that's blended with plant-based protein. So it's got half the beef and maybe it's got half plant protein as well. That's interesting. I haven't heard someone bring up the blended before. I feel like for a lot of people, it's like a light switch. Mm. It's on or it's off. <laughs> Maybe, but I think that a lot of people wouldn't care. You know, there may be some people who say, I'm willing to spend more to go to buy like a Beyond Burger. But I think there's a lot of people who wouldn't care if the restaurant that they were buying from boosted their products with plant proteins. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Purdue, which is the fourth largest poultry company in the country, is right now releasing a product that is uh, part chicken and part of it is boosted with plant proteins that are actually supplied by my company, the Better Meat Co. And so the Better Meat Co's um, partnership with Purdue enables them to sell chicken nuggets and chicken patties that have less chicken and more plants than the conventional solely chicken products they might otherwise sell. And there's a lot of people who are interested in that, who say, hey, I want to dip my toe in the plant-based waters. And in the same way that most people who buy Beyond Burgers also buy beef, many people who are buying this chicken are quite happy to have the plant-based protein, not just in connection with the meat, but also uh, in the meat itself. Are we at price parity now? Uh, depends on who you say we. So uh, my company, The Better Meat Co., does sell our products for prices that are somewhat comparable to that of conventional meat. Most plant-based meat, though, no, it is not near price compare, uh, price parity. So uh, the Beyond Burger is still sold at multiple times the cost of conventional beef per pound. But if you look at um, some of the stuff, like in fast food, it's not that much more expensive sometimes. So, for example, if you go to Burger King right now and get the Impossible Foods Whopper, it's only $1 more than the conventional Whopper. So instead of like five, it's six bucks. So, uh, you know, sure that's like a 20 percent price increase but it is still getting pretty close to somewhere where it's not going to make as big of a difference what would you say to someone who wants to avoid soy i know it has estrogenic properties mm -hmm. uh well yeah it's phytoestrogen uh, excuse me phytoestrogens though so which is different from estrogenic in fact uh the studies really do show that soy consumption tends to decrease your risk of cancer including in women decreasing the risk of breast cancer so i do think that the concerns are a little bit overblown however if somebody disagrees and they think they don't want to eat it that's fine go eat a beyond burger they don't have any soy in it at all many of these products don't have soy in them in fact our product with purdue doesn't have soy in it so there are some companies that rely on soy like impossible and i i, I don't think we should fault them for it at the same time uh, it's pretty easy to avoid soy if you want, because a lot of these companies are now using uh, things like pea protein or wheat protein or even uh, more novel ingredients like lentil protein and so on. When do you think or do you think that lab grown mm. will eventually overtake plant based? Ah, you know, this uh, it's like this uh, million or maybe billion dollar question, Matt. So, you know, first and foremost, I'd say. You know, it's, it's only a lab grown is a little bit of a misnomer. So I understand what you're saying because you want to make it easy for people to it's understand. Because if I say clean meat, then people kind of yeah. get confused. Yes, I totally understand. Uh, but, you know, for what it's worth, I, I recently toured a uh, beer making facility and they have these gigantic bioreactors. They have microbiologists with white lab coats walking around with clipboards. And I was thinking, hey, why does anybody call this lab grown beer? Like there may, it looks just like a lab to me, like so call it lab grown beer. Uh, but that's kind of what uh, what clean meat facilities will look like. They really have large fermenters where instead of fermenting yeast cells to make beer, they're fermenting animal cells to make meat. Uh, but the point is, you ask this question, when's it going to happen? And honestly, I mean, I don't know. I think that plant based meat is going to keep taking off like a rocket. I do think that clean meat is going to get commercialized uh, by 2021. 
but that's still going to be a tiny little portion of the market. So when will it overtake it? You know, I, I think then you're, you're talking about decades uh, rather than years. The most optimistic uh, analysis, which is done by Barclays, suggests that plant-based and clean meat combined by 2030, so a decade from now, could be about 10 percent of the total meat market, which you know, would be a massive, massive increase over where they're at today. To be fair, McKinsey put out reports when the cell phone, the iPhone came out, basically saying there'd be like 100,000 in 10 years. I feel like <laughs> when, when you have those type of changes. I, I, yeah, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. With, with, I would say specifically with lab grown meat, I could see certain people not wanting to do the vegetable route. I mean, even just in America, because we don't eat vegetables. But in terms, <laughs> of the, in terms of the clean meat, once you're able to say, this is animal flesh without something having to die, it just yeah. seems like if you get to that point, if you get to the health point, if you get to the price point, you're just a bad person if you want something to die for it. <laughs> well, I would say this. Most people today eat meat not because an animal was slaughtered, but because really in spite of the fact that an animal exactly. was slaughtered. Very few people are sitting around thinking, hey, I want this meat because an animal lived in a cage in her own feces. They're thinking, you know, I really don't want to know how my meat is made, actually. Ask how many people would go like to tour the farm or the slaughter plant where their meat was produced. They probably don't want to know what happens, and they certainly don't want to see what happens. However, with queen meat, when you are brewing this meat, you know, it would be the most transparent uh, meat-making facility in the world. They're welcome. People will have glass walls. People will be coming in. Uh, in fact, you may be able to even do it yourself. Like, you can envision in the same way that Maybe, uh, you know, today you go over to your friend's house and they've got uh, an ice cream maker or a bread maker on their counter. Maybe they'll have a meat maker on their counter and they order little stem cell tea bags and they drop them in and they can make their own meat and watch it grow right there. I think that would be pretty awesome. And I would love to live in, in that type of a world. So I agree with you wholeheartedly, though, Matt. I think consumer acceptance is like the least of the concerns for these startups uh, really, you know, getting over potential government regulations that might restrict them that would be done at the behest of the cattle industry or getting over technological hurdles to bring in the cost down. Those to me seem like much bigger barriers than consumer acceptance. Speaking of regulation, what about like a Trump burger where we start growing people like th these are the kind of yeah. things where th this will be plausible. You want to eat Ashton Kutcher? Go for it. Here's our special mix. You know, if you think you're a fan of Matt Ward's podcast and you haven't had a cube of his flesh yet, you're not really a fan. That's what I say. Exactly. We're going to open the store, guys. Who cares about Patreon? We can uh, we can sell it off big time and go for the, go for the butt roasts. Yeah. I mean, I guess the question is, like, does it matter? Obviously, lots of people would say, oh, that's disgusting. They're against cannibalism. Um, I, I'm not I'm, I'm not making a pro cannibalism argument here, but I am saying that cannibalism is actually pretty frequent in, in human history, especially if you look at, you know, like the Aztecs and the Mayans and many of many tribal peoples did engage in some type of cannibalism, even going back to the days when Homo sapiens were meeting up with Neanderthals, they were all human, and there was a lot of evidence that they were eating each other. So um, it's not like I'm pro-cannibalism by any means, uh, but to the extent that somebody wanted to do it and they wanted to do, engage in ethical cannibalism, uh, there is a method of doing that now. We already do grow human tissues regularly for medical purposes. Like, let's say you burn yourself, we can grow your skin not just human skin, but grow your skin and put it in there. So uh, it's not something I'd be interested in, but I do think it would be quite a news story if somebody did it. If you're going to do it, don't go for the brain. That's where the mad cow stuff comes from. So, yeah, you want to yeah, you want to avoid the prions, but the muscle might be yeah. might be safer bet. Yeah, yeah make, make the zombies. So switching gears a little bit into mm -hmm. something equally as controversial, what are your thoughts on genetically modified organisms, GMOs, crops specifically? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's a it's a sword that can be used for good or for bad. I certainly do not have a knee jerk negative reaction in the way some people do. Uh, you know, we require technology in order to feed a growing population. You know, there's 7.7 .7 billion of us on the planet today and we are rapidly expanding. So if we want to continue feeding ourselves, I really think that we have to be serious about what type of technologies we're going to utilize to do that. Now, at the same time, most GMO crops, if you do have a concern about it, most GMO crops are grown to feed farm animals. You know, you look at the GMO corn and soy, those are being grown oftentimes the majority of it for feeding farm animals. So if you really want to avoid GMOs, uh, switching to a plant-based diet would actually be a far more efficient way of doing that and to 
um, reduce the number of GMOs that are planted. I'm not sitting around thinking, worrying about GMOs for for the most part, to be honest with you. Um, but for those who are, uh, you know, I would say, you know, meat is the biggest contributor to, to the existence of GMOs because of how much uh, corn and soy farm animals eat. What are you sitting around to worrying about? Huh. Well, the number one thing I'm sitting around worrying about is whether or not we can actually pull this off on time. You know, we're in, we're experiencing environmental collapse. Thousands of species are going extinct because of humanity. It might be upwards of a million eventually that go extinct because of us. We are warming the planet far beyond where we can uh, sustainably have any type of uh, civilization that we want. And so when you combine the biggest drivers of climate change with increased population, you end up seeing a civilizational risk that is extremely real, that's going to call, continue causing massive amounts of suffering, and that could lead to really uh, extremely catastrophic results for humanity as well. So that's my biggest concern, and that is what I'm devoting my life to trying to stop by helping to come up with far more efficient ways that we can feed protein to an increasingly hungry protein, a protein hungry population. And increasingly efficient ways to make business freaking awesome and change the world. Business for good podcast. That's how I found you guys. What's the oh, story cool. behind that? Oh, that's nice of you, Matt. Yeah. So I host a, a podcast called Business for Good in which we profile both titans of business and entrepreneurs who are using the power of commerce to actually improve the world. So, you know, some people view business as the problem. We use this show to focus on businesses that are trying to invent new solutions. And so, you know, we have uh, interviewed uh, executives from companies like Whole Foods and Honest Tea to startups that are doing really cool things. Uh, one of my favorites was a recent interview where, you know, we have coral reef die offs around the world. Well, there is uh, one company that is doing some really cool things called Coral Vita, where they have invented a new way to get corals to grow at numerous times the speed that they do in nature. So they, they are coral farming and creating vast numbers of corals that they can then go plant onto coral reefs that are threatened and have healthier, more resilient, more climate resilient uh, corals in the hopes of saving some of these reefs. And they're being paid to do it, not only by their investors, but their clients are, um, let's say, for example, hotels and other resorts that want coral reefs, not only for snorkelers, but also, and scuba divers, but also for uh, protecting their beach from, uh, from erosion. So uh, there's a big business to be had in saving the coral reefs. And I think that's one example of how we can use commerce for the purpose of actually uh, saving the world. One of the big challenges I see is that most of the venture capital is going towards things that can have exponential returns, but those aren't necessarily the things mm -hmm. that society most needs to deal with. For instance, uh, I, I do a little bit of investing. How many photo sharing apps do we need? How do, how do, <laughs> we, how do we deal with that? And what are the best principles you found from the podcast, from interviewing influential leaders in terms mm -hmm. of building a business that has those core principles and then is able to carry through? Yeah, so I totally agree with you. I mean, I look at what many of these startups are for, and I mean, many of them are just, you know, they're doing something that may be profitable, but it, it doesn't seem to actually contribute much to the world. Um, and, you know, new photo sharing apps are a good example of that. Um, in fact, maybe they're doing bad. Maybe they make people feel bad about themselves seeing how beautiful everybody else is. Uh, but that's an aside. Um, you know, one of the most interesting lessons uh, that I have taken from this is uh, actually two. One is resilience. So a lot of these people who are starting these companies for altruistic reasons are really devoted to what they're doing and they can withstand both adversity and success in a calm way and chart the course of their company without getting to drag down and caught up either in their hard times or their good times. The other is to remember that sustainability means also being profitable, that you can, if you have come up with a solution, let's just say, keep it on coral to, you know, to be able to save the coral reefs through your company, but you're not profitable. You haven't come up with any solution because your company will stop existing. And so making money for your company, it's kind of like a, a good example of this is from John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, who uh, gave a good analogy on the show when I interviewed him. He said, you know, your body has to make red blood cells in order to survive. If it doesn't, you die. But making red blood cells is not the purpose 
of your body. The purpose of your body is to do whatever you deem that purpose is. Well, the same is true with a company. A company has to make money in order to survive, but making money is not the purpose of your business. The purpose of your business is what you determine it to be. In the case of Whole Foods, it's to promote public health, essentially. In the case of a company like Beyond Meat, it's essentially to reduce the raising and slaughtering of animals to, uh, for sustainability and ethical concerns. And so, yes, you need to worry about the mission of your company, but if you're not making money, you're not sustainable. Yeah, it's really, really hard to do the charity model. And if it is, you eventually have to kind of sell yourself out to raising money. Yeah, all the time. I mean, all the time, for sure. And you're asking people for money that they're essentially giving away. Sure, they're going to get a tax write-off, but that's pretty minimal compared to the amount of money that they are giving away. And so if you instead have an idea that could effectual, you know, effectively do what that charity is trying to do, but more efficiently, why not go to investors and have them put their money in your company with a chance of getting a return on it? Speaking of which, guys, if you want to donate to the Disruptors, disruptors.fm slash Patreon. How do, you, how, how do you think about this? So you're a busy guy. You have a lot going on. You run the podcast. You run the company. And you seem to have a few other projects in the works. How do you think about managing time and then creating impact? Well, uh, number one, I think it's really critical to be able to segment your time and have some type of a personal life. And my wife reminds me of this regularly. So uh, I can sometimes go a little too far on the work side. And so my wife will do things like send me calendar requests for us to go have dinner, which, of course, sounds uh, pretty unromantic. Uh, however, I, I kind of like it. I think it's nice. And um, so I would you know, I, I really am, am very adamant about trying to make time for meaningful relationships in my life uh, that are, um, you know, going to help me be more productive and are going to help me lead a better life. And my wife is a you know, paramount example of that. Uh, at the same time, um, I know that, you know, there's lots to do. And, you know, I've got, you're right, I have a lot of projects that are, are ongoing. And what I try to do is to use my calendar as a way to block off time. So most people will use their calendar for, um, you know, meetings or something. I'll use it to just block off time. So I'll know like next week I'm spending these two hours doing this type of research or this type of writing or something like that. And that's actually a very helpful tool for me to avoid getting sucked in to having, well, I'm like, hey, I got nothing on my calendar there. Sure, I'll schedule this. And then, you know, certain things get pushed back all the time. So that enables me to use my calendar more effectively and therefore use my time more effectively. What's your time spent look like in terms of proactive, <clears throat> reactive, and then planning? Uh, I, you know, have to think about that for a second, Matt. So, um, you know, nearly all of my time is spent uh, running my company, The Better Meat Co., uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about it. I'm really grateful to be working with extremely dedicated people who I absolutely love working with. And so uh, most of my time is on that. And I'd say um, I'd say of that, it might even be an even split between proactive and reactive, actually. So, you know, you've got proactive in terms of reaching out to potential customers, to potential investors and so on. And then reactive in terms of, you know, there's things that are happening all the time in the company to work on, you know, like there are things that are unglamorous uh, that you do, like, you know, favoring out uh, things like supply chain and other things like that. Walk me through your process to take on funding. Well, what, um, so your thought process, sure. I mean. Uh, well, you know, we want investors, preferably, who are ideologically aligned with us, folks who don't just want to see a return on, on their investment. Of course, we want them to see a return on their investment as much as they do, but we want people who also believe in the mission of our company. And so, yes, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of VCs out there who will say, hey, you know, this space is white hot right now in plant-based protein. You know, can we talk? But if they're not interested necessarily in what we're doing I'm less likely to engage than I am for people who I really think ha are tied to the mission of our business because we really are a mission driven business. So that would be one. And then I would also look at who they have invested in. If they're invested in uh, similar companies in the space that it shows they have some depth of knowledge about it, that could be good or bad. You know, they could be invested in a potential competitor of ours, which we would not want to do uh, for fear of like trade secrets spilling over, for example, or they could be invested in other companies that aren't competitors of ours in the space. We would consider that too. So how do you think about you're building this business now and yet with farming, with food tech, what do you see as the future of that? Is it large scale? Is it small scale? 
Uh, honestly, I think there'll be a blend of both. So um, there's a reason why large scale agriculture provides the overwhelming majority of meals to people because it's just a lot more efficient. Uh, however, I do think there's always going to be a demand for smaller scale production because people will have some romantic attachment to it or they think it produces better food or for whatever reason. And so what I would like to see, though, is to have a lot of agriculture move from uh, taking up vast tracts of, of land in rural areas to either moving into vertical spaces in urban centers, so you're growing uh, lots of food vertically, either through aeroponics or hydroponics. Um, you can see a lot of food moving into, um, into more enclosed spaces like meat production that would occur in like meat breweries, as opposed to raising vast amounts of corn and soy to feed to cattle who are kept in feedlots and then slaughtered and then shipped all over the country. And then that way you could actually have local production of, of these meats in the same way that, you know, you think about a place like in Africa where, where uh, cell phones displaced the need ever for a landline infrastructure. They just jumped over landlines. Well, rather than constructing factory farms in Africa to feed a, uh, a hungry population there, you could see how cellular agriculture could do what cellular phones did in that you could have facilities set up locally uh, that would just be brewing meat out uh, for folks. And the same thing in the United States. I could see, for example, in the same way that you might go to a restaurant today and they're brewing their own IPA in the back, they're putting their own local artisanal touch. Why couldn't they be doing the same and be brewing their own meat in the back as well? Interesting. I feel like with lab brewed meat, that's even harder <laughs> to say than lab grown. I'm just going to say lab yeah. grown. I feel like there's going to be major startup costs in terms of yeah. the, the tech, IP, and talent required. Although, you know, there's some really cool things happening. So, for example, there's a company in Japan called Integriculture, and, you know, they've been giving out meat growing kits to high school students in Japan for them to brew their own meat at home. Uh, in other words, not that high of a cost. It's true that originally the very first of these products cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to make, but those costs have fallen precipitously. And just in the same way that the first smartphone uh, cost over in dollars, you know, now we're most of us are walking around with them in our pockets and we don't think anything of it. So uh, I do think that the costs will continue falling and that eventually they'll fall to beneath the price of conventional meat. What technologies outside of your own are most related to your field? Um, well, I think it depends. So if you're thinking about uh, uh, clean meat or, or meat that's cultured from animal cells, you're looking at all types of biotech. You're looking at uh, tissue engineering, chemical engineering, uh, bioreactors, uh, microbiology, and so on. In the plant-based meat space, you don't really need tissue engineering so much, but you do need um, people who, for example, uh, are experts at a technology called extrusion, which is basically a way that you take plant proteins and change their molecular structure so they have a texture of meat instead of a texture of plants. Uh, those are the type of people, definitely food scientists are really key, and culinary experts, chefs, are really uh, important in this as well. What type of meat type products can we replicate right now? I can obviously see like the burger, the patty, the sausage. Will we get to the filet mignon, the slice of salmon in terms of plant-based? Hasn't happened yet. Um, so you are really going to see a huge amount of ground meat, chicken nuggets, sausages, meatballs, hamburgers, and so on. Filet mignon, not so much yet. Nobody's been able to crack that code. Um, there are like whole meat uh, things like, for example, uh, plant based chicken breasts, but uh, that's it. And uh, I do think that somebody will come out with it at some point. There is a uh, Dutch company called Vivera, which claims that it has a good uh, product that is very steak like. I've, I've seen photos of it, but not actually tasted it. Looks pretty awesome to me. Um, but I've never seen anything that you would not be able to visually distinguish from a steak. You know, you look at a, at a Beyond Burger, it's very hard to distinguish it visually from a beef burger. I've never seen anything like that on a steak yet. Yeah, it's like the calamari we were talking about earlier. Yeah. What percentage of land is used right now for animal agriculture, both the animals and then the actual feed? Uh, it's a huge portion. I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, maybe in the show notes we can include that afterwards. But I don't remember the exact numbers. But it's a huge amount of the ice-free land on Earth is used for either 
raising animals or growing feed for animals. And in fact, you know, right now you have this major uh, for, uh, firestorm happening in the Amazon rainforest. And we have to remember, this is not just occurring in some, you know, regrettable accidental way. This was started by cattle ranchers who wanted to clear more land for the cattle grazing. And the, the government in Brazil now basically turned a blind eye saying, we're going to let you do it. So uh, the reason the Amazon is burning is because they want to be able to export more meat to hungry meat eaters around the world. Now, that's not, you know, I'm going to say that in some judgmental finger wagging way. I say it just to remind ourselves that, you know, there are consequences to the diets that we eat and their global consequences that every time we sit down to eat, we make a choice about what type of world we want to live in. And we can choose foods that can heat up the planet or we can choose foods that cool down the planet. We can eat foods that are going to leave a bigger footprint or a lower footprint. And that choice is up to us and we can make it three times a day. Speaking of which, guys, tuna, super overfished. So avoid those tuna cans. We're going to be at something like more plastic in the ocean by weight than fish by 2050. It's terrifying. Uh, yeah, I've read that statistic. It's pretty horrifying. And um, I mean, it's it's beyond belief. So, you know, there are some really cool plant based fish companies and clean fish companies as well. Already companies like uh, Sophie's Kitchen and Ocean Hugger Foods are doing some really awesome things uh, making plant based seafood. And then there are other companies like Blue Nalu that are really making progress on growing fish cells that uh, will be utilized. And, you know, I joke about it. It's, it's really kind of like what Jesus did. You know, he multiplied the fish to feed the masses. That's what they're doing. They're taking fish cells and, you know, taking microscopic fish cells and multiplying it so they can feed the masses. So it's a kind of cool take on, on the biblical story. And yet I feel like a lot of people would be turned off by lab grown meat, so to speak, because it's not natural, at least until we get have that turning point. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, my presumption is that if you ask people, you know, hey, the chicken that nearly all the chicken that is produced in our country comes from birds who have been genetically selected to grow really, really fast, so big that they have a difficult time even walking more than a few steps before they collapse. They live in their own feces. They live wing to wing with tens of thousands of other birds. They never step foot outside. They generally are being given antibiotics. And then when it's time to take them to slaughter, most people really don't want to hear what happens next. And that's the convention of what people eat in terms of chicken meat every day, typically today. And so when people think about growing animal cells into meat, many times when they consider how today's meat is actually produced, Growing animal cells seems like a naturally preferable option. You're correct, but most people don't make that comparison. They don't think one versus the other because one yeah. feels natural. I don't think about, should I brush my teeth today or should I rub my teeth on a something else to clean them? It's just, it's, yeah. it's the default. It's the reason why companies pay so much money to be the default search browser. Yeah, I think you're right. But I think you were also right earlier in the interview when you said, you know, when there is an alternative that is available that is identical to what people have been eating, except it didn't involve raising and slaughtering animals, I think a lot of people will be pretty down to eat it. Maybe not everybody, but even if a substantial portion, even if 20 percent of people did that, it would be revolutionary. You don't need very many because once you start start the ball rolling, you can guilt people and like, really, dude, you're, you're eating that de <laughs> dead burger? Come on, man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I really, well, really it, it so. is. It, yeah, it is questionable, like how that would happen, like whether our. I think it'll be. I think it'll be a change. takeoff. I think it will be an absolute um, takeoff. Yeah, I mean, I think about it almost like whaling. In that, you know, for centuries we killed whales in order to light our homes. We had whale oil was like the main, is huge industry in the United States, even in the colonial uh, era. And so, you know, when you had, uh, there were real concerns about extinction of whales back then. And people writing letters to the editor of newspapers that pleading for mercy for whales. Uh, but, you know, when kerosene got invented, we all of a sudden had a much cheaper, more efficient, cleaner way to light our lamps in our homes. And whales were liberated. They were liberated not from sustainability or environmental concerns. They were liberated because of the invention of kerosene for the most part. And after that, people started once we were no longer reliant on the slaughter of whales to light our homes. You saw much more concern in the decades to come about whales. And because we didn't have that cognitive dissonance anymore. And so in the same way today where people might think that cows 
and chickens or pigs, they might think pretty poorly of them or that, you know, they're dim-witted or whatever, things that are, are false. They're actually quite intelligent animals. But once we're no longer reliant on their exploitation, maybe people will feel differently about them and recognize them as being uh, far more mentally interesting than we had ever given them credit for in the past. We have to justify something to ourselves so we can sleep. I want to jump to the lightning round. Sound good? All right, let's do it. Oh, it looked like you had something to add on that. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, there's a saying. Um, I don't think he invented it, but uh, A.J. Jacobs, the great author, one of my favorite authors, I've heard him say it many times, where, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, people must change the way they act before they change the way they think rather than the opposite. Many times we think, oh, if we change the way we think, new actions will follow. But in reality, changing the way we act will change the way we think. And that might happen when we reduce our reliance on farm animals. We may start thinking about them differently. And for anyone who loves AJ, we had him on the podcast a couple episodes oh. ago. So go check it out. It was a good one. Yeah. And he, he very generously provided a blurb for my book, Queen Meat. So he, of course, he must be a really great guy. He's a really great guy. Apparently, he helped Tim Ferriss with getting his book written as well, the first one. <laughs> So oh, I hope he, I, I hope he got one percent of those royalties. <laughs> I don't think he, I don't think he got anything other than oh crap! I just helped somebody crush it. But no, yeah. it's not, I think it worked out well for him being on the podcast yeah. with yeah. Ferris. Yeah, he was. I listened to that episode. It, it was really great, and uh, I'm a huge fan of AJ's lightning round, guys. So this is back to the support. If you want to help us make this sustainable, disruptors.fm/slash Patreon. If you support us at a level of five dollars or more per month, you unlock some bonuses. <laughs> Like what we're about to jump into, the lightning round, where we get all the greatest stuff ever, plus a little bit more. But seriously, consider supporting us so that we can keep this sustainable. You ready to do it? I'm ready, Matt. I want to jump back to the interview itself now and want to pivot it a little bit. So for listeners that are listening, you run the Business for Good podcast. What are some of the businesses you would like to see out there created? So certain industries that you feel this is something yeah. that could change the world, but also make some money. Well, uh, one that I've been thinking about a lot lately is relating to plastic. So all of the plastic that has been created uh, since humanity invented plastic like 70 years ago or so still exists. Either it's, uh, you know, floating around in the ocean or it's buried in landfills or it's uh, it, maybe it's got some of it, a small percentage of it has been burned up into the atmosphere, but it doesn't biodegrade. And yeah, we should be making plastics that do biodegrade. But even if you do, even if we switched over 100%, to biodegradable plastic today, you still have the problem that you have billions and billions and billions of tons of plastic still in our landfills and in, you know, all over the planet in the oceans and so on. And there are, however, some microorganisms, especially some fungi, that we know will degrade plastic. They do consume and digest the plastic itself. They're not GMO. They're not, you know, not that I would be concerned if they were, but I'm not saying you have to like invent a new organism. Uh, there are organisms we know of today that do that. And so I'd like to see some companies that could pursue some type of a method of actually degrading plastic. And you can see them making money by, for example, uh, doing business with municipalities that would divert their plastic waste to them. And rather than paying to have it recycled, they could pay this company to take it and then they could uh, digest it and hopefully get something that actually has some benefit out of the digestion process and then sell that as a commodity itself. Yes, for the back to mo back to the future mobile, we power it with trash. I would yeah. love to see that. That's a that's an awesome one. If anyone's working on that, then be sure to reach out. Yeah, and I'll tell you one other thought about it. So you don't even need the organisms. Like, let's say the fung the the way that these fungi do it is uh, there's like some enzyme that they're producing that ends up degrading the plastic. You could synthesize that maybe. I mean, I'm I'm not saying this like I'm some mycologist with expertise, but I'm saying why not synthesize. Um, uh, hold on. Sorry like about that. Like stomach acid, <laughs> essentially. Stomach acid yeah, from fungi. Yeah, that's right. So you, you could, right, exactly. So you basically synthesize their the equivalent of their stomach acid, and then uh, you don't even need the organisms at all then. Then you just put this enzyme on the plastic. It would be a pretty cool technology. That would be an epic technology. What in the last week has most inspired you? Uh, actually, my wife, Tony Okamoto, who is an author. She has a new cookbook out that is called Plant Based on a Budget. And she has been killing it, doing uh, lots of uh, TV stations around the country, including national stations like the Hallmark Channel and local uh, stations. And I'm just really impressed that this is somebody who started her own company and has grown it from being, you know, having no income whatsoever 
to now having uh, staff who are working for her and a really great uh, business that's doing a lot of good in the world by helping show people how to eat plant-based for very little money. And now the terrifying high pressure question. What's it like working with your wife running the podcast together? We did the first episode together. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me, Matt. We did the first season together. So the first 20 episodes of the podcast we did together. Uh, in the end, uh, we decided that it was probably better that we not do it together anymore. And so season two, which has only put out a few episodes so far, um, is just me. She does reserve the right to... Uh, come on and co-host again for future episodes. Uh, but so far she has not taken up that right. And uh, I think, you know, she's happier because of it, but she also has a, another podcast that she does, which frankly is more popular anyway, <laughs> that is called uh, plant powered people that she does. And um, is that's going well too. So she, with one podcast, that's sufficient for her. I like it. It's uh, it's one of those things. It's, I imagine it's super hard balance to crack. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's, it, there's a, a reason why they say it's good for uh, spouses not to work in the same department if they work at the same company. So uh, I, I can see why. <laughs> we, we won't dive it any deeper into that. Who, if you could have anyone on the podcast, would you want to see? Would you want to talk to? Would you want to learn from? Oh, there's so many folks. Um, but I mean, I would love to talk with Elon Musk. I know that's kind of like a stereotypical answer. But, you know, there's a guy who is, you know, really motivated by trying to do what he perceives as uh, as making the world better. People have all types of opinions about him. And I'd love to talk to him about how he handles that. You know, he's motivated not necessarily by wanting to be a billionaire, which he obviously is. But, you know, there's a guy who's motivated to try to save us from fossil fuels, try to uh, save us from extinction. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, I'm aligned with him on everything. Uh, you know, he has a massive goal of populating Mars, for example. I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm a little skeptical of that. Uh, but I'd love to talk to him about it. And I think he's like one of the most uh, innovative uh, and creative people uh, there is on the planet and, and, and has been for a long time. So uh, I'd love to talk to him and uh, get his thoughts about creativity and resilience and um, and ask him whether he thinks humanity has earned the right to be a multiplanetary species, actually. I think for him, it's not so much about the right. It's more about having a backup plan, which I can very much see as a good thought process. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, every species has gone extinct. So, um, you know, the question is, like, should we exempt ourselves from that? And look, I'm not suggesting that I'm, I'm pro extinction. That's obviously not true. Um, but I guess I would wonder, like, you know, the amount of money that it'll take to, like, terraform Mars and do all these things there could be spent giving us better chances here on Earth. And I wonder, like, you know, what's better. And I don't know. I mean, I'm a huge astrophile. I love space exploration. So I'm torn on this myself. Um, and I want to do what's best for humanity as well. Uh, but I, I do wonder about it. I mean, we could just divert the US military budget and we could solve all those problems as well. So you kind of got to you kind of got to choose your apples, so to speak. <laughs> okay, so I, fair point. Yeah, I, I would I would choose the Mars apples, but that's just me. Is there anything yeah. else? Well, you're, you are, you are co common in my social circle. Oh, I would not, I'm not saying I would want to go to Mars, but I would much rather yeah. the funds get spent on that. I might go uh, once there's a return oh, ticket. I see. I see. You mean compared to the military budget? I see what you're Yeah, saying. if we can spend yeah. money killing right. each other, or we can spend money exploring. It seems like a pretty right. easy choice. Yeah, I did like what Elon said about, uh, he said, I, I really, uh, he goes, I would like to die on Mars, just not on impact. Now, that was pretty funny. It's a, it's a perfect one. He he can get those yeah. one-liners occasionally. He misses on Twitter though. But, but uh, one last, <laughs> two last questions for you. What was the one thing I should have asked you about that I didn't? Um, you know, I I guess I would say that you know um, there's a, a tension for people who want to uh, make the world a better place because oftentimes they are told, yeah, go into nonprofit organizations and and try to or NGO you know NGOs or uh, government try to make the world a better place. And far less do you hear you hear people telling them go into business. And so I, I think, you know, for people who really want to make the world a better place, there's nothing wrong with going into an NGO or going into government. Those are totally admirable professions. But uh, I would, you know, why not also think about using business to try to solve some of the most vexing problems that, that humanity faces? Completely agree. I can go to Africa and build houses. I can start a business building houses in Africa, or I can start a business loaning money to people to start businesses building yeah. houses in Africa. <laughs> Exponential growth. There we go. Yeah. We're, we're making yeah. change happen. 
What would you want to leave people with a quote, a call to action before you tell them where to find you? Um, well, I would suggest the following. All of us are going to die pretty soon. And so when you think about what type of an impact you want to leave on the planet, just accept that you're going to be forgotten. Uh, you know, think, I mean, nobody could probably even name their great grandparents, uh, let alone have a much of an interest in what they did. So we're probably going to be forgotten pretty soon as well. But we're only here for a very, very short amount of time. And the real question is, what type of an impact can we have? And my view is that while we're here, let's use this time to actually reduce the suffering that is so endemic on our planet. That suffering, whether it's going to be endured by our fellow Homo sapiens or other animals with whom we share our planet, is really the motivating uh, mission that I have to try to reduce the amount of misery that we especially are inflicting on others. And we can't totally lead lives that don't involve causing harm to others, but we can lead lives that we can be proud of and say that the world was actually a kinder, better place because we had lived, that there was less suffering on the planet than had we never been born. And that requires active work. It's not just being a nice person, which of course we all should be. It means actually doing work to try to alleviate the suffering of others, which I think is the highest calling that we can have. I would agree. And don't kill yourself if you're not perfect. Do the best you can because we're all human. <laughs> Yes, we can end on an anti-suicide note. Surely do not anti-suicide <laughs> note. We did it. Where can people find you, Paul? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Paul H. Shapiro. You can contact me that way or uh, go to my own personal website, which is paul-shapiro.com. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. My email address is there. Feel free to hit me up anytime. I'd always welcome it. Awesome, Paul. Thanks for coming on. Matt, it's my pleasure. It's been fun talking with you. Guys, thanks for coming in. It's time to go do some good. Speaking of which, check out their podcast, leave us a review on iTunes as well, and share this around with a friend if you think that we could all do a little more kumbaya and make the world better. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Matt.